Well, we are in the middle of a new series. If you just joined us, we generally go straight through books of the Bible, line by line, verse by verse, but we just spent about a year going through the book of Ephesians, and in between our books, we like to do short topical series just to take a, a break before we go into the next book, and that's where we find ourselves right now. And last week, we started a new series, and you can flip one more. We're having technical difficulties today, so if all, this, all the words aren't on the screen, if they flow off or something like that, we'll fix it for next week. But we called it, or I called it, the four truths. Um, and the, the idea behind um, the series, or the question that this series uh, intends to, to answer, is why do some Christians share their faith and others don't? Because we all have the same fears. We all have the same obstacles to sharing our faiths. Most of us aren't, you know, born communicators or born salesmen or, or you know, born, you know, extroverts who would just walk up to anybody and start talking about anything. Most of us have the same fears, the same trepidation about speaking in public, the same obstacles that would prevent us from sharing our faith. But... Um, some people seem to share their faith and some people don't. In fact, the vast majority of Christians, from what I've read, do not share their faith. And I'm not talking about going out on the streets with a bell and screaming about your faith. I'm talking about sharing it with anyone. And so, this series um, is going to... Uh, help us to maybe discover or talk about some of those things that would enable us or empower us uh, to share our faith. And my suspicion is, with this series, that if you're not sharing your faith, that perhaps um, it's because um, uh, we are misunderstanding or maybe not believing some of these four foundational truths. Um, and a right understanding of these truths, a proper belief uh, and understanding of these truths will enable us to experience the kind of relationship with Christ that we would want to share with others. Is that up there? It is. Okay, great. You're doing great, Bob. Nice job. <laughs> um, so, here's what we looked at last week so you can get a taste, if you weren't here, for what I'm talking about with these truths and beliefs. The first truth that we looked at last week is that grace is amazing. If you do not have the type of relationship with Christ and understand that grace is amazing, then you probably will not be um, inspired to share your faith with others. Just like we talked about last week, somebody who has been through a divorce, a messy marriage, or, or some kind of bad relationship is less likely to go to other people and say, you should be married, you know, or you need to, to, to you know, have a, you know, you need to have a husband or a wife. They're less likely to say that if they've been through a bad experience. So maybe you don't have the type of relationship, or maybe we are not experiencing the type of relationship that we would want to share. Maybe we're not experiencing in our relationship with Christ all that God intended for us to have, and a right relationship with Him, a right understanding and, and belief in these four principles, or these four truths may enable us to have that kind of faith, that kind of relationship with Christ that we would want to share. So the first one, grace is amazing. And here's what you need to understand about grace. We talked about it last week is this, that no one else relates to us in grace. No one else relates to us that way. Every other relationship in your life is based upon merit. Even if they say, even if your parents say, oh, I love my children unconditionally, well, we know if you're a parent that that's not entirely true. There are things that they can do that could affect your relationship with them, affect the way that you view your children or the way that they view you or your spouse. I love my wife, but there are things that I could do that would affect the way that she looks at me and the way that I look at her. The only relationship in your life that is based upon grace and not upon merit is your relationship with your Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and your relationship with God because God sees us through the lens of Christ. God sees Christ when He sees us if you are in Christ and trusting in Him for a right standing with Him. Jump one more. So here's what we looked at. God not only demands righteousness from us, we looked at how God demands our righteousness, He also provides our righteousness. And because God demands our, our righteousness, or God demands righteousness, He also provides us with righteousness. And because of God's grace, 
not our merit, not what we earn, but because of Christ, because we are in Christ, those who are in Christ have everything we need to be accepted by God. And what we said by that is this. What does God think of you? What, you know, when God thinks of you, what's the expression on his face? Uh, you know, is he disappointed? Is he elated? Is he overjoyed? Is he, you know, sad in some way? You know, boy, that guy, Tim, he just needs to try harder or he needs to do more, or he hasn't done enough yet, if he just tried a little more. If you are in Christ, you need to realize that God does not relate to you according to merit. He relates to you according to grace, undeserved grace, which means that no matter how many times you fail, no matter how far short you fall, no matter how many times you've disappointed God, he is delighted with you, not disappointed, because he is delighted with his son, Jesus Christ. Your performance, uh, even on your best day, never measures up. That's not why God accepted you. You're accepted because Christ measured up. Because God is accepting of Christ, he is accepting of you, if you're in Christ. So, that makes grace amazing, meaning no matter how many times you fail, how far short you fall, you are still accepted if you are in Christ. That's amazing. The only relationship in your life that way between you and your Savior, you and your God. So here's the question. I started last week with a question. And so I'm going to start this week with a question. Where do you expect to be in 100 years? I shared a little bit about myself last week, um, and a lot of you know that uh, I was not a Christian until I was in between 28 and 29. I was almost 30, really, before I was a Christian, and it was a slow progress from there of me learning about my faith. Um, but if you had asked me at any time in my life, did I think I was going to hell, and by the way, this is a very serious topic this week, um, so... Don't expect to laugh too many times. Um, if you asked me, did I expect um, that I was going to hell, I would have told you, no, absolutely not. Before I was a Christian, after I was a Christian, at no time in my life would I tell you that I thought that I was going to hell. Um, and you know what? I've looked at statistics inside the church and outside of the church, and the vast majority of people, no one believes that they're going to hell. Everyone believes that they're going to heaven for some reason or another. Whether they're a Christian or not a Christian, it's like 90-something percent of people believe that they're going to heaven, whether they're a Christian or not. And I could tell you that 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 was the way that I thought. I thought that way. I thought, you know what? Maybe my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. Maybe God is a nice guy and he'll just, you know, you know, look over what I did. Or for some reason or another, I justified myself that I was going to heaven, even before I was a Christian. And then after I was a Christian, because I knew hell was a really bad place. And, and so, just to show you, if you believe in heaven, you must believe in hell. Because the reason that we believe in heaven is because of what it says in God's word. And so, God's word also talks about hell. And so, lots of people say, well, you know, I believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell. Or, you know what, I believe in how to get to heaven, but I don't believe in that I'm going to hell. But you know what, if we believe the scriptures, you have to believe all of it. You can't pick and choose which part you believe and which part you don't believe. So just to show you that I believe that, you know, Jesus talks about hell actually more than he talks about heaven. And here's what um, he has to say about hell just to show us all that we don't want to go there and it's a really bad place. So here's what he says. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. Jump one more, Bob. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm that eats them, or the worm that eats them do not die and the fire is not quenched. That sounds really bad, right? 
I don't want to go to hell, and I don't know anyone who wants to go to hell. And Jesus' whole point here was, you don't want to go to hell. His whole point was, you know what? You think your hand is important to you? You think your foot is important to you? You think your eye is important to you? Well, it's not as important as your eternal soul and where your soul is. Because, you know what? Everyone lives forever somewhere. You don't want it to be hell. And so that was his point, how serious it is, how, you know what, you think your physical body is important, and it is important, but it's not as important as your soul is and where you spend eternity. And he was telling them, avoid anything, you know, do anything that you can to avoid going there. So that's a place we don't want to be. Now, we know that he meant that um, figuratively because we didn't see a lot of people in the first century walking around with one hand and one foot and one eye because they had plucked them out and cut them off. We know that he meant, you know, do all you can to avoid it. Cut off whatever you need to in your life to avoid going to hell. And so that's the point. We don't want to go to hell. No one wants to go to hell. Sounds like a terrible place, right? Sure does. Okay, so here's what I thought. Jump ahead. My thought was this, that you have to do something really bad to go to hell. Hell was like prison, that you've got to do, I understood that, you know what, God needs to put some people in prison because, you know, we do that in society to keep, keep society safe. Some people violate laws and they must go to prison and you know what, we get our sense of justice from God, and so some people must be separated, taken away, must be punished for their deeds. Now, um, the problem was that I thought, and most people, as I'm looking at these statistics, think that you have to do something really bad to go to hell because, you know, in my mind, you have to do something really bad to go to prison. Um, you know, you have to maybe murder or, you know, theft or, or rape or something like that. And those people, we would all say, belong in prison if they've committed those crimes. So I can understand how God is just for punishing people that have committed crimes, just like our court system is just for punishing people who have committed crimes. I thought, maybe like some of you think, uh, obviously, some people think that way because even inside the church, these statistics told me that many people believed you had to do something very wicked to be sent to hell, that it was like going to prison. Here's what 1 Corinthians says. This is what the Apostle Paul says about some of the people who are deserving of hell. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Well, you know what? I'm, I've done some wrong. Does that make me a wrongdoer? Maybe it did. I, I don't know. So let's go on here. He says, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Do not be deceived. Neither, neither the sexually immoral. Well, what's sexually immoral? You know what? I have had sex outside of marriage. Is that sexual immora immorality? I would say yes. God would say yes. Um, uh, what about idolaters? I'm not an idolater. I don't worship idols, but you know what? There were things that I loved more than God. Things that I pursued more than God. There are things that I focused on more than God. There are things that I would have chosen over God rather than being um, thankful to God for creating those gifts and giving them to me. I made those things out to be my God and pursued them regardless of what God said. Maybe I'm an idolater. Um, nor adulterers, well, whew, I've never committed adultery on my wife. Um, but Jesus said that if you've lusted after a woman, that you've created, that even if you never touched her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Well, I guess I'm guilty there, too. Men who have sex with other men. Um, I did not do that one. Nor thieves, well, I've taken things that do not belong to me. Even though they were little things, does that make me a thief? I suppose that it does, doesn't it? You know, what if it's only worth a dollar and I stole it? Hell, it doesn't matter if it's worth a dollar or a million dollars. It still makes me a thief, doesn't it? And how many things do you need to steal to be a thief? Well, how many murders do you have to commit to be a murderer? Just one. Um, 
nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that's quite a net there that Paul puts out for us. In Revelation 21, John says this in Revelation 21, 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice the magic arts, uh, the idolaters, and all liars, who's ever lied? You don't have to raise your hand. Put your hands down. I know you've lied because you lied to me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we've all lied. So are we all guilty before God? We are. That's such a broad, I mean, he has just pretty much taken everyone you've ever met and said that all of them are guilty. I see, um, and here's what he says, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Jump one more. See, here's the issue, that God's justice was even more holy than I thought that God's demand of righteousness was even more than I thought. See, years ago when I was in the military, what happened was um, there were certain things that were illegal, uh, that were against the law. For example, you could be in a lot of legal trouble in the military if you were caught committing adultery. Um, if you were caught uh, doing, you know, uh, certain things, but particularly adultery, um, homosexuality, if you were caught when I first entered the military, you would be disciplined for those things. You would be in trouble. Um, but now, my son has just joined the military, those things are no longer um, uh, against the law. That you, there's no longer a punishment for them. And the reason why is because as we have become more corrupt, our standard of corruptness has gone farther away. Kind of like anybody who's over 40 is going to get this. You know, when I was 15, 21 was old, right? And then when I turned 21, 30 was old. And then when I turned 30, you know, 40 was old, right? Or maybe 50 was old. That as you get closer to the line, you know, it gets farther away, right? Well, as we have become more corrupt, our line of where the, you know, our, our sense of where the line of um, who deserves to be punished gets farther away, of who deserves condemnation gets further away. And I suspect that as time goes on in our country and in our legal system, some of the things today that are illegal will no longer be illegal, that people will no longer be punished for them as we continue to move down that road of, of corruption. But God never changes. God's standard of justice is always the same. And God is so holy that he's not only going to punish, which we would believe, murderers, you know, and, you know, rapists, but he's also going to punish, you know, the sexually immoral, those who sleep with their girlfriend, right? Those who, um, who lie, uh, because he is so holy. And his standard of justice never changed. He's even holier than I thought. And that was, that was the case. But here's what I thought. Did you jump one more, Bob? Excellent. I thought, but you know what? I'm a Christian now. And this, this set of verses right now, um, it actually um, scared the heck out of me when I first became a Christian because I thought, well, I'm going to church. I'm, you know, I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing good things. I'm working for God. Um, and, and you know what? And I... I don't want to go to hell. I don't think I'm going to hell, you know, I, because you have to do something really bad to go to hell. But this is what Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Those are people who profess Christ as Lord. Those are people who are in church. Those are people who believe in God. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we read your word? Didn't we teach other people your word, right? Um, didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we perform miracles? Didn't we volunteer at the soup kitchen? Didn't we feed the needy? Didn't we help people who were in need in your name? Didn't we do all of those things? Didn't we take communion? 
Didn't we get baptized? You know, um, didn't we listen to your teaching and, and devoutly give our money to the church? Didn't we do all these things? Then I will plainly tell them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers, because you're still guilty and in your sin. But we don't like to think about that. But see, here's the truth that we need to accept. If you're going to accept that there is a heaven and that there is a hell, and it's based on what you read in the Bible, then you need to accept this, that the default destination of man is not heaven. That, that the default destination is, is not heaven. That we are born sinful. We are born guilty. And we continue on that road, barring what? Us going to church, not according to Jesus. Us, you know, helping out and volunteering and, and doing even miracles in Jesus' name? Nope. Barring a relationship with Christ so that he wouldn't say, I never knew you. That it is a relationship with Christ. But the default destination of man is not heaven. Well, I would rather focus on the happy verses, right? Wouldn't you? I'd rather focus on the happy verses so I don't spend much time looking at hell or warnings about hell in the Bible. I want to focus on the happy verses, and that's what most people do. So jump ahead here. This is one of my favorites, John 3.16. Right? Everybody knows, if you know any verses at all, you've heard, you know John 3.16, right? And here's what it says. For God so loved the world, right? Oh, that's good. That's better. Let's focus on his love, because he is loving. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes, that trusts, nothing mysterious about it, that trusts in him, that we trust in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, whew, good, but to save the world through Him. That the reason that Jesus came like a missionary into His creation was to save us, you know, not to condemn us. And so many people are so happy about that. I am thrilled about that. But they completely forget the next verse. And they focus on the fact that, you know what, I'm forgiven, I'm saved, I'm in Jesus. And when they come to Christ, they, fo they completely forget about what they are saved from. Here's what it says. The next verse says this. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, whoever does not trust, whoever does not have a relationship with Christ, stands condemned already. Already? Yes. From, from birth, from your conception, in your mother's womb, you were guilty. You were condemned. We were born condemned. Why? Because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So, you know what? That means that all of the people you know, all of the people I know, and you and me too, were born, and by default, on our way to hell when Christ saved us. We, were, we don't like to focus on that. We don't like to think on, about that. But you know what? It's something that we need to think a little bit about. And we'll see why in a second. In fact, at the end of John chapter 3, here's what Jesus says. He says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life why not? Just because they rejected Jesus? What if they were a good person? Doesn't matter. They were still guilty, whether they were a good person or not. Whether they were nice, whether they were friendly, whether they were devoutly religious. Doesn't matter. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains. That means it was already there. Remains on them. We are born under God's wrath as the penalty of sin because God is just. But God isn't only just, God is also gracious. And in Christ, we can be forgiven. In Christ, at the cross, our sin was paid for. But here's the truth that we need to dwell on, and we'll talk about this in a minute. People without Christ go to hell. 
That's what the scripture says. And it doesn't matter about their behavior because just like by no one's behavior are they going to be declared righteous only by being in Christ, you know, they're also um, not going to be declared innocent by their behavior or exonerated from their guilt only by being in Christ. That was the way that God in his foreknowledge made that people would be able to um, exhibit his grace and his mercy by accepting Christ and by him um, uh, washing them of their sins, by him paying the penalty for their sins so that they could be forgiven and accepted by him. People without Christ go to hell, but everyone in Christ is saved. And here's what you need to know. You need to know what you're saved from. Because so many people, so many Christians that I talk to, they don't necessarily believe they were on their way to hell. They believe that Jesus saved them, so now their day is going to be a little better. And their step is going to be a little higher. And you know what? And they're a Christian. And like belonging to a club. Or this is who I am. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a Christian. And just like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a... You know, the I'm a Cub Scout. You know, I'm some other group or some other club that you identify with. But people without Christ are going to hell, and that included us. But everyone in Christ is saved from hell and spared from the wrath of God, the wrath that we deserve, the punishment for our sin, the payment for our sin. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I know that, you know, most of the people in here, if not all of you, um, claim to be Christians. And I'm not saying that you're not or anything like that. I'm just saying you need to know this um, for the simple reason that if you don't know what you're saved from, you won't appreciate your salvation. If you don't know what you're saved from, if you don't realize the terrors of hell, then you won't appreciate what Christ did for you by paying for purchasing your salvation. And you really won't have much inspiration to share it with others unless you can really fully grasp it, what he did for you. See, um, if you don't realize that you were lost, you won't experience joy over being found. You know, you ever find a kid in a grocery store and so the parent is so thankful, oh, I'm so glad I found you. Well, the kid didn't realize they were lost. They were off looking at something and, you know, you found them. They, it's no big deal to them that you found them, but the parent is thrilled that they found their kid, right? The kid could care less, doesn't even realize he was lost. And there are a lot of Christians walking around like this. You know, um, I heard a story, we're going to call the guy Dave, okay? And Dave um, had only ever ridden in an ambulance twice in his life. The first time he rode in an ambulance, he was in a car accident, a multi-car car accident, and he had bumped his head, and so they put him in the ambulance. He was doing okay, but they sent him to the hospital to be checked out. And since we live in the country, it took him a while to get to the hospital. So he rode in the back of the, the ambulance um, with the uh, EMT, and the EMT was a very, very friendly guy, and he talked to the EMT, he got along with the EMT. It was like a 20, 25-minute ride, and he's talking to him the whole time, and he thought, well, this, this guy is a really nice guy you know and and we really hit it off um, but he never even he can't, if you asked him today he wouldn't remember that EMT's name or anything like that it really didn't make an impression on him he had a favorable opinion of the guy he liked him but you know I don't remember his name or anything like that but the second time Dave rode in an EMT or rode in an ambulance got all kinds of issues today. Okay, the second time Dave rode in an ambulance, it was because he was unconscious and he wasn't breathing. And um, when the ambulance came, the EMT that arrived was actually a guy who lived in his neighborhood. A guy that he, he really, eh, he didn't like him or not like him. He didn't have any opinion of him at all, really. Uh, he could take him or leave him. And this guy, um, performed CPR on him for 40 minutes to the point where um, he was not giving up on him. To the point where um, he had muscle spasms in his back and in his arms and, and uh, where he um, um, he had, could, could even have given himself, I think he had like maybe even a slight hernia 
from working on this guy for like 40 or 45 minutes, not giving up that he was going to save this guy's life if at all possible, if God allowed, right? Dave wasn't a a awake. He wasn't conscious for any of that ride. He didn't talk. He didn't hear one word that guy said. But when he finally came through and when he finally was told what this man had done for him, he was moved. He was moved to the point where he needed to find out this man's name and found out this man's name. And he went to the man because he only lived like a neighborhood away and he wanted to thank him. And his whole outlook and perspective had changed about EMTs. He used to get those letters in the mail asking for donations for the local volunteer, you know, things. And he, he thought nothing of it. But now he, it meant something to him. And he would volunteer and he would give money and donations because he realized for the first time where he would have been without this man's intervention. That he would have been in a graveyard somewhere. And it affected him greatly and affected his outlook greatly. As Christians, we need to recognize what we have been saved from. Because that is what's going to motivate us to share our faith with others. That's what's going to motivate us to be thankful to the Christ that sacrificed for us. Not so that we could have a good, good time, you know, in life. Not so that we could get together and have fellowship. Not so that we could dress up and come to a church and sing hymns and with our brothers and sisters, but so that we could be spared from the wrath of God in a place that the Bible calls hell, where there is conscious torment where we pay for our sins. Wow, it's a lot to think about, isn't it? But you know what? If you weren't aware that you were drowning, you wouldn't be thankful to the person that saved you. We need to be aware that without Christ, people go to hell. If you believe any of the Scripture, that's what the Scriptures teach. And that's what should motivate us. That's what should deepen our relationship with Christ, that you know what? I used to just have a favorable opinion of Christ, but when I found out what He did for me, what He rescued, what He saved me from, it made me say, you know, oh, that's my Lord and Savior. That my, my faith was deepened and I experienced the kind of um, faith that I wanted to share with others because I didn't, no longer had a misunderstanding or an unbelief that, you know what, everyone who picks a religion will be okay and it doesn't matter what they believe. For the first time I believed that those who don't have Christ go to hell. And that's where I was headed, short of God's grace in my life. Imagine this. Imagine the difference it could make in our relationship with Christ if we truly believed that we were going to hell without Him. Would it deepen your response to what Christ did for you? Would it deepen your relationship with Him? Would it change the way that you parent and what was important for you to teach your kids? Would it change the way that you viewed your neighbors? Would it change the conversations that you have? Would it change the way that you spent your free time? Would it change the way that you spent your extra money? What would it change in our lives? What impact could it have on our community and on our church if we actually believed that short of our Savior's work, we were on our way to hell and that there is a whole bunch of people, in fact, everyone you know who is not a Christian that is in the same boat that we were in? So what should we do? Here's what I want us to do. I want us to pray that God would help us to see ourselves as people deserving of His wrath, but rescued because of His grace. Because of His grace in Christ toward us, we were rescued, we were forgiven, we were washed, we were sanctified in Christ. And we received the reward that Christ deserved, and He took our punishment. And when I, the second thing I want you to do is this. Begin praying 
for the person that God brought into your mind that needs to hear about His grace. If you remember last week, what I asked you to pray about was this, to ask God to bring one person to your mind, in your life, in your daily, you know, whether it's a family member, a friend, a co-worker, that needs to hear about God's grace and how He has accepted them if they are in Christ regardless of how short they fall, regardless of what they've done, regardless of the mistakes they've made, of the sins they've committed, or the ones they'll commit in the future, if they're in Christ, they're accepted. Begin praying for that person that God brought to your mind. Begin praying for opportunities uh, to share God's grace with them. Imagine the impact that that could have in this young church in Honesdale, in a place where the gospel really has not taken root yet. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we know that this is...